Hi folks, Fusion 360 fourth axis. Let's walk through how we use the rotary tool path to machine this part on the Tormach MicroArc fourth axis. This is not a cylindrical object, meaning some of the other traditional fourth axis tool paths in Fusion can't handle this style geometry, but rotary can. I'm not gonna lie, this part kicked our butt. Seems like we got caught up with every little quirk and bug from the programming side to the post-processor to setting it up on the machine, but we got it, we learned a lot. So let's share that and hopefully that helps you when you're running fourth axis parts. Feel free to use the timestamps to jump ahead. So what makes this part different than a cylindrical fourth axis part is you can't just unwrap this part. So for example, a baseball bat. No matter where you are as you move along a baseball bat, it's just a series of circles. This part, if you were to unwrap it, has differing geometry. It's long been known that Fusion didn't handle that very well or at all on the fourth axis. And it's worth noting why. A huge number of CAM companies license or buy a lot of their key CAM kernels or programming elements from a company called ModuleWorks. Autodesk made the decision with Fusion to bring this in-house, to have ultimate control and destiny over how that toolpath works, how we program it, how we use it. And the rotary toolpath is one of those first examples. It actually came from a company called Delcam and Partmaker, which Autodesk now owns. And rotary toolpath gives us that ability to machine non-cylindrical objects along our fourth axis. There are three different styles within the rotary toolpath. There's circular, which wraps around the part and then moves over, usually an X, does another circle around it, moves over an X, etc. As it's wrapping around that though, it is able to handle those different geometries. So meaning it's probably moving in the Z plane as it's moving the A axis. The next is spiral. This is the one that I think of. It seems like the most natural fit is a true toolpath that comes into the part and moves in Z and X simultaneously as the A axis is rotating. Very similar, frankly, to the nature of the threads on this part itself. And then finally, there's one that's a bit different that's called line, which moves along X, varying the Z as it goes. And then when it's done, it will index or rotate the A axis. It's worth noting that circular can be great if you don't wanna go all the way around your part, if you only wanted to go to say from zero degrees to 270 degrees and then stop. Similarly, line is able to have angular control over what part of it you're machining. Line didn't look as good to me. It doesn't seem as natural a toolpath. And for sure, anytime you're entering and exiting the cut or you're cutting sort of perpendicular to the nature of the workpiece, that's a little bit of a red flag. But honestly, we got great results of it. And when we were having some post-processor issues with the simultaneous nature, line saved our butt. So don't overlook it. If your goal is just to get a part made, line may actually be the trick. On a Tormach and any machine that doesn't have dynamic work offsets, your fourth axis work coordinate system has to be on the center of rotation. So in this case, the Y, and the Z have to be on the center line of our micro arc. We're using the front face and this back edge here to constrain the area of work. And the step over will control basically the resolution of the detail. As you decrease the step over, you'll get less cusping or scalloping, but at the expense of a longer toolpath. You can also do something really cool with this toolpath, which is tool offset. The software can handle compensating in Y so that you're cutting more with the side of the tool than you are with the tip. If you're new to machining, especially speeds and feeds and cutting tool geometry, check out our intro to speeds and feeds videos that walks through why it's really bad to cut with the center of a tool. And you avoid it at all costs by doing things like bottom up machining or cutting with the side of the tool, not the center tip. And finally, we use sock to leave as a roughing strategy. One of the keys to getting a good surface finish in any machining application is presenting an even amount of material to the cutting tool. Even an incredibly high-end machine with an incredibly rigid tool and a rigid part will be affected or subjected to things like deflection. So when we're trying to get those good finishes or those accurate parts, those good looking parts, allowing that cutting tool to see an even amount of material as it's moving through the cut doesn't actually stop tool deflection, but it keeps it consistent. So stock to leave here is an easy way to rough it. Even if we're roughing with the same tool, that way when we come back in and do a finishing pass with no stock to leave, we've got the best finish. We've moved to using NC programs for almost all of our machining applications, but I really recommend it in situations like fourth axis work where the post property settings really matter. You can create a new NC program by going to setup, create NC program. The settings that are important here, obviously the post processor, but also you scroll down the rotary axis table setting. It's probably the number one 
complaint we hear from folks is I can't get my fourth access to work and they don't realize they have to tell the post not only do you have an a fourth axis, but which way it's pointing, X positive or X reverse or X negative. In theory, X positive should mean your fourth axis is pointing to the right or X positive. For whatever reason, we've seen or heard of some mixed results. So if for some reason it seems to be moving backward or you're getting text cut backward for say, just try switching it and see if that solves your problem. A good trick to test this is to air cut and an easy way to air cut is to cut with one tool and in your tool table, add one inch to that tool length. Now be careful doing this because you need to remember to set it back. Our rule of thumb for that is we place a large blue object on the machine or on the machine doors. That reminds us that we're in a weird situation, say an intentionally incorrect tool length or say feed rate override. But that'll let you watch the movement of the tool without actually cutting into your workpiece in case it's wrong. The second biggest issue we've heard about is make sure you're using the latest post processor. One of the really cool things about Fusion is there's constantly post processor updates. Generally speaking, the system setting, the system library will have a list of with the most recent ones, but it's always worth double checking, especially if you're having problems. And there's a link right below the post to pull up the Autodesk Fusion 360 library. And as an example, if we look at Tormach, you can see that barely over a month ago, they pushed another update to this post. Remember earlier when I mentioned that sometimes there's an issue with how your machine handles simultaneous fourth axis motion? That bit us here, and the reason was, initially we were struggling with this G93. If you're new to machine, you probably never heard of G93, and frankly, that's okay. Uh, G93, though, is a different way of handling feed rates. It's pretty cool. For almost all three axis work, we program in inches per minute or millimeters per minute. Basically, we say go X amount of distance per minute of movement. That doesn't always work though when we move into multi-axis world of both fourth and fifth axis projects. And the reason is that one axis may not be able to get there in time. For example, the Z may only have to move a 0.1 inches. It can do that almost instantaneously, but the A axis may have to rotate halfway around. That may take one or two seconds. So you'll end up the situation of, of one axis gets theirs first, and the other one just has to wait. G93 handles that by switching you into an inverse time feed rate mode. It's the most beautiful thing ever because what it means is instead of focusing on a defined motion rate, it says get there at the same time. If you're having problems with a fourth axis programming like this running smoothly, two solutions that we've come up with. One is switch to that line toolpath. The way that toolpath is programmed, there is no simultaneous A axis motion, so there's no need for inverse time. Now that may not be the solution you're looking for, but sometimes you're just trying to figure out what's going on behind the scenes or how do I get this working now. The other recommendation I have is make sure you're not trying to go too fast. You can read more about inverse time if you wanna go down that rabbit hole, but it, the way the feed rates work are one divided by the feed rate is I believe the minutes of completion. If you have too high of a feed rate, it may be still trying to go faster than one of the axes can move. And you're better off slowing it down so that everything can get there at the same time. Now, this isn't as much an issue if you have the ultimate high-end five axis machine tool out there, but we've even seen this on our Haas where we're better off slowing down the feed rate so that we have a smooth, continuous flowing part because smooth is steady, which is better finishes. That's what we wanna see. Ultimately though, in the end, we had no problem running this at what a program fee rate of 60 inches per minute. The last bug that we have was we were still getting some jittery motion at one point and we couldn't figure out what it was. It ends up, we had one of the pins in the connector get pushed back a hair and it was arcing between the two. So it was making a connection sometimes, but not all of the times. It was a bummer to see this happen. Luckily, it was a relatively easy fix. It's a good reminder not to overlook what are sometimes the simplest solutions like, are my cables all connected correctly? And finally, we cut the blanks for this project on the Tormach 8L. It was one of the first things we ran on it. I'm so far very happy with that machine. And I think there's a huge opportunity out there for a smaller CNC lathe that can do what it needs to do well, which is relatively small parts, relatively accurately, inexpensive, relatively small footprint. Uh, we've got our Haas SC20Y. It's an amazing machine, but it's huge and it's expensive and it's complicated and it kind of scares me. Uh, so being able to run small one-off parts, fixtures, test parts, uh, running single point threading and turning so forth is great. So long as it's accurate and it looks good. So far, we're liking it, but we're gonna put it through its paces. More to come in a future video, I'm sure. Otherwise, folks, hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.